Hey everyone, we've got another video in our series on choosing components. In this video, we're going to talk about PC cases and what you should look for and consider when you're choosing one for your build. We'll talk about things like compatibility and clearance, form factor, a case's role in cooling and airflow, and case aesthetics. Then at the end of the video, we'll walk you through how we choose a case for the $1,000 gaming PC build that we're putting together. First off though, let's discuss form factors and case sizes. There are four common case sizes, full tower, which are larger cases, mid tower, which are medium or regular size cases, micro ATX, which are a bit smaller than mid tower cases, and mini ITX, which are much smaller and more compact. Technically though, there are no standards for case size, at least in terms of the dimensions of the case. All cases, however, support one or more of the various computer motherboard form factors. The most common motherboard form factors are extended ATX, standard ATX, micro ATX, and mini ITX. The bigger the case is, the more likely it is to be able to hold a variety of motherboard form factors. For instance, some full tower cases out there can hold any of the four common motherboard form factors. This is because motherboard mounting is based on standard ATX motherboards, and all smaller form factors utilize, for the most part, the same mounting hole pattern as standard ATX motherboards. They just use less of the mounting holes. Of course, putting a mini ITX motherboard in a full tower case is going to look silly, but in terms of compatibility, it is possible to do so. On the other hand, smaller form factor cases are limited by their size and therefore cannot accommodate the larger motherboard form factors. For instance, you cannot put a standard ATX motherboard inside of a mini ITX case or a micro ATX case. But again, this is really the only standard that binds the different cases in a common case size together. What that means is while all mid towers share the ability to hold standard ATX motherboards, not all mid tower cases have the same dimensions and feature sets. And the same goes for the rest of the common case sizes. So really the main thing to consider when it comes to motherboard form factor when you go to buy your case is that you ensure that your motherboard you have chosen or are planning on choosing will fit inside of the case you are considering purchasing. Of course, this can easily be accomplished by simply checking the case's spec sheet and seeing which motherboard form factors it can accommodate. While the motherboard form factors that a case supports are one type of compatibility issue that you will need to consider before choosing a case, you will also want to make sure that all of the other components you choose will fit inside of your case. The most common clearance and compatibility issues to watch for when looking for a PC case are graphics card length, air CPU cooler height, and liquid cooling radiator size. Longer graphics cards can cause clearance issues in smaller cases, and some high-end graphics cards, which are typically longer, can cause clearance issues even in some mid-tower cases. So before you finalize your part list, you need to check the spec sheet of both your case and graphics card to check how long your card is and how much clearance for a graphics card your case has. If your case can accommodate graphics card lengths that exceed the length of your graphics card, then you are good to go. If not, you will wanna look for a shorter alternative. Just like some graphics cards are longer than others, some air CPU coolers are taller than others, and not every case is deep enough to accommodate the tallest air coolers. To ensure that the CPU cooler you have chosen will fit inside your case, again, you'll just need to check the spec sheet of both the case and air CPU cooler you are considering. Your case's spec sheet should specify how tall of a CPU cooler it can accommodate, and the CPU cooler you are considering will list its height. If you're building a small form factor PC and you're limited on space, and you don't have the budget for a liquid cooler, or you just don't want one, you'll likely need to limit your search to a low profile CPU cooler. Liquid cooling systems, whether all-in-one liquid coolers or custom loops, Utilize liquid to transfer heat from your processor to a radiator. The radiator has fans installed on it, which then dissipate heat from the radiator out of your PC. However, radiators come in multiple sizes, and just like how not every case can accommodate every CPU cooler and graphics card, not every case can accommodate every radiator size. So before you choose a liquid cooling setup, whether that's an AIO or a custom loop you'll be building, to pair with your case, it's important that you check your case's spec sheet to ensure that the radiator that comes with your liquid cooler will fit inside of your case. Furthermore, cases can offer support for different radiator sizes at different locations on the case. For instance, a case could support a 360 millimeter radiator on the front panel of the case, 
but only a 280 millimeter radiator on the top panel of the case. So before you finalize your case and radiator choice, you'll need to consider how you want to configure your setup and make sure your case will allow you to do so. While the biggest draw for PC cases for many first-time builders will be their aesthetics, cases do play a significant role in the cooling process of your computer. Keeping your components cool is obviously an important part of building and maintaining a computer. The cooler your components run, the longer they will typically last, and the fewer problems you will run into. Computer cases contribute to or hinder the cooling process by the airflow they provide or fail to provide. And as mentioned, your PC case will also determine what kind of CPU cooler you can get. If you want to choose a case with high airflow and good cooling capability, consider the following. First, the case should have the ability to accommodate multiple fans at various locations. This doesn't necessarily mean that the case you choose has to come with a bunch of fans pre-installed, although that is a major plus. Most cases only come with a few fans pre-installed, and cheaper cases typically come with only one fan pre-installed. But budget permitting, you should try and choose a case that has the option to add multiple fans. And it's always a good idea to get a case that can accommodate fans on the front and back or top of the case so that you can intake air from the front and then exhaust it out the back or the top. The second thing you should consider are the design of the case's panels, as they will play a large role in airflow. Cases that have grilled or mesh panels are ideal because the open design allows more airflow into and out of the case. On the flip side, cases that have solid panels restrict the air coming in and exiting the case because there is less of an opening for air to get into or exit the case. So when possible, try and choose a case that has grilled or mesh panels, especially on the front of the case, as that will increase the airflow into your case, which will in turn keep your components cooler. The third thing you need to consider, which we've already mentioned before, is that certain cases will not be able to accommodate certain CPU coolers and liquid cooling radiators. And while that doesn't necessarily mean that those cases aren't good options in terms of airflow and cooling, it does mean that they will have some limits on the types of coolers you can install in them. This is just my opinion, but I sincerely believe that if there weren't so many cool computer cases to choose from, a lot fewer people would build their own computers. It might seem like a silly opinion, especially since cases have no direct impact on your system's performance, but just imagine that the only case you could get was one of those old cases that companies like Dell and HP used to use. In any case, case aesthetics are important because most people want their build to look cool, whatever cool might mean to the specific individual. So in this section, I'll go over four different aspects of case aesthetics that you should consider before choosing a case. The first thing you should consider for case aesthetics is cable management. In my opinion, there are three different types of people who will build computers. One, people who are incredibly particular about their cable management. Two, people who do a decent job at cable management, but aren't going to take it to the extreme. And three, people who just don't care about cable management and will do the bare minimum. For the first two types of people, choosing a case that is designed with cable management in mind is the way to go. If building a clean looking system is one of your goals, then doing your due diligence on a cable management is a must. You can color coordinate all of your components, you can get a case with a tempered glass side panel, and you can fill your system with a bunch of RGB lights. But if you don't clean up your cabling, your build isn't going to look good. While cable management is a bit of an art, and people who excel at cable management can probably make the cabling look good in any case, having a case that has plenty of cable management options is going to go a long way towards helping you hide your cables in an efficient manner. This is even more true for first-time builders who are likely going to be more focused on not messing up when building their PC than they are on ensuring their cables are routed in an organized manner. The extra cable management features that some cases come with will make the process easier for first-time builders so they don't have to worry about it as much. Some cable management features to look for on prospective cases are plenty of holes, hooks, loops, or straps to route and tie down cables, rubber grommets or coverings around cutouts to conceal gaps, cases that have some depth behind the motherboard to accommodate large groupings of cables, and power supply shrouds are nice because they help conceal the bulk of cables coming out of your power supply, and in our opinion, they help contribute to a clean overall look. If you want to build a nice looking system, a case with a see-through side panel will help you show off the inside of your PC. And if you take your time and do a good job managing your cables, 
you can earn some serious credit among your non-techie friends for how cool your computer looks. It's important to note that not all side panels are made equal. Tempered glass side panels are your best bet. If you can avoid an acrylic see-through side panel, definitely do so. With a case that doesn't have a PSU shroud and with a non-modular power supply, you could do every other aspect of cable management perfectly, but if you don't have anywhere to hide the mess of Molex and SATA power cables that are left over from your power supply, you're going to have a huge eyesore to look at inside of your case. With a PSU shroud, that mess is hidden by default. Even if you do have a semi-modular or modular power supply though, a PSU shroud helps provide a clean look that keeps the focus on your main components. With RGB lighting being so popular, it's no wonder that there is an ever-increasing number of cases that feature RGB lights in some capacity. Of course, RGB fans and RGB LED strips can be purchased separately and added to a case that doesn't come with them. But if the case already includes them, that's less RGB lighting you have to pay for after the fact. Also, perhaps the most challenging task of putting a lot of RGB lighting into a build is ensuring that you can hook up all of your lights in your desired configuration. Some motherboards only come with a couple of RGB headers, so if you have multiple RGB lights you want to connect, you'll need to use something like an RGB controller, an RGB hub, or splitters. This will take some research on your end as you'll need to know how many RGB headers your motherboard comes with, what kind of RGB headers they are, 4-pin 12-volt RGB or 3-pin 5-volt ARGB. You'll also need to know the style of RGB lighting you're considering, addressable RGB fans or standard RGB fans, RGB strips, etc., and the features your desired case will come with. Does it come with an RGB controller? What types of RGB fans are pre-installed, etc.? There are literally hundreds of case options to choose between. The right case for you will come down to first, how much you have to spend, and second, the other components you have chosen for your build and whether or not they are compatible with the case you are considering. And third, your personal preferences on some of the aesthetic factors discussed in this video. We recommend allocating around five to 10% of your total budget to your case. So for us, with our $1,000 budget, we'll be looking to spend anywhere from 50 to $100 on our case. We also have to take into consideration the other components we've chosen. We've chosen a standard ATX motherboard, so that will eliminate all micro ATX and mini ITX case options. We've also chosen a Gigabyte RX 7800 XT graphics card that measures in at 302 millimeters long. And we've picked Thermalrite's Burst Assassin CPU cooler, which measures in at 154 millimeters tall. So we need to find a case that can meet that criteria. We also want a case that has a mesh or grilled front panel, and we prefer to get something that comes with multiple fans pre-installed. If we can get RGB fans from the get-go, that would be even better. We also know from the last video that we have about $160 left to spend of our $1,000 budget, and we need both a case and a power supply. Now we've already made our case decision, it's right here obviously, but let's walk you through the process we took to choose our case. First we went to Amazon and we searched for mid-tower cases and changed the price range from $50 to $90. Some of the options that immediately stood out were the Corsair 4000D for $80, the NZXT H5 Flow for $85, the MSI MagForce 112R for $65, the Antec NX410 for $70, and the Fantex Eclipse P400A for $85. From there, we just needed to go to each of these cases product page on the manufacturer's website to check their spec sheet to make sure they met the clearance requirements. Now we already did this for each of the cases and we found that all of them can physically hold all of our components. So then it really just came down to a personal preference. All of these cases came with mesh front panels so they should all at least be acceptable on airflow. However, the Corsair 4000D and NZXT H5 Flow only came with two 120 millimeter fans pre-installed, whereas the other three options all came with at least three fans pre-installed. So we eliminated those two off the bat. While the MSI and Antec cases were a bit cheaper, we liked the P400A a bit more. Looking at the inside of all three of those cases, the Fantex P400A was the only one that offered rubber covers on the two main cutouts for routing cables. Furthermore, a look at the back of the motherboard panel shows that Fantex includes three Velcro straps to help tie down cables. So taking all of that into consideration, we thought the P400A would work well for our build and it is the case we ended up choosing. At $85, that leaves us with about $70 total left to spend on our power supply. I think we'll need to go a little over that in order to get a quality unit 
to power this build, probably somewhere between $80 to $90, so we will likely end up slightly over our $1,000 budget. In the next video, we'll go over power supplies and what you need to consider when you choose one for a new PC build. We'll see you there.